Hey everyone, welcome back to Data Driven Health Radio. And today we are honored to have Mr. Len Pastrano on the show with us here today. Len is the founder and CEO of New BioAge, which is a platform for educating practitioners on cellular medicine compounds and supplements. Among other things, New BioAge runs case studies on tracking outcomes for various cellular medicine compounds. And uh, we're just honored to have Len on because he's definitely one of the studs in the game. And uh, he's not an easy guy to get a hold of, but he has incredible expertise. So Len, thanks, man. I know we've been trying to schedule this for quite some time, and I'm glad we finally made it happen. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, and I know you know what's busy because you're, you're pretty busy yourself. <laughs> Yeah, we're both out there building our companies. I know just before we got on here, you were telling me about a new project you're working on that's just kind of sent you down the late night rabbit hole. And and for us, it's the same thing, figuring out how can we build heads up and we get these great ideas and we go down the rabbit holes. You know, So we're both kind of building our vision and our dream, which is such an opportunity in life to be able to really invest your time and energy on something that you're so passionate about. So it doesn't feel like work, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it was just, you know, always wasn't like that. And you know, that that's pretty special. Not everybody gets to, to do yes. that you know, in this Great. life. And so definitely yeah. very grateful for the opportunity to do that. Uh, Len, we're going to dive into the um, body composition stacks that you presented on um, some of your educational platforms. I think there's, there's incredible knowledge in there for uh, people out there who are looking at just changing the composition of their body losing fat, uh, building muscle, that, that's something that um, never ends for, for people. And, and as your body ages, what, what used to work for you at one point in your life needs to change based on how your body changes, your metabolism changes, your cellular processes change. So there's a lot of stuff we can unpack. And there's an incredible stack that I think we can dig into that I've, I've really found powerful for my own use. I know you have as well. But before we dive into all the nitty gritty, uh, maybe you can uh, educate us just a little bit on your background as a pharmacist and um, how you got into uh, healthcare. I know you've got a, a personal story that you've shared a bit about with your own body recomposition journey. So um, just give us an, up, an update on, um, on your background in, in healthcare and how you got into cellular medicine. And then uh, we'll dive into the topic of the day. Sure. Yeah. So I, I am a pharmacist. I worked you know, for a long time in your traditional retail setting, like CVS Pharmacy, um, which is a really, really tough job. You know, I, I hated it. I stayed there way too long. It was um, not what I expected. You know, when I was I was done with pharmacy school, you know, just like kind of handing out Band-Aids every day, never seeing anybody get, you know, any better, really. Um, it just really wasn't rewarding. And I found that I, you know, I needed to get out of there. And um, I got into more clinical positions working as a clinical pharmacist in the hospital. Uh, I enjoyed that a lot more, um, for sure. It was much more interesting. It was much more um, fulfilling. But even there, uh, something felt, you know, missing just because, you know, you'd, you'd go into work and you see a, you know, 50-year-old patient and the entire screen was filled with all the medications that they were taking, you know, when they, when they got in before they even got into the hospital, right? And it's like, where do we even start here? And yeah. so I, I kind of got a little bit disinterested in, in healthcare in general, just because I was just looking for something just more fulfilling, right? And, and I, I kind of got away from healthcare and I was looking for other avenues. I got into self-development and entrepreneurship and, and um, was looking for a career change, really. And I, at that point, I, I had become obese. I was you know, about 60 pounds heavier than I am now. And um, as I was, I was learning from other entrepreneurs and learning from other, other people, I realized they were very fit. And I realized that they had better advice for me when it came to you know, how to be healthy or how to have more energy and how to, how to operate at a higher level than you know, most of my, my colleagues in, in healthcare. And um, that's when I started to make a, a change in my life and, and got you know, into a healthy form of, of living. But I thought I was done with, with healthcare in general until I met up with um, a friend of mine that I went to pharmacy school with that had an independent pharmacy. And he told me something about, you know, peptides that he saw his patients were coming in and refilling them over and over again. And he said that, you know, it was getting better results than he had seen in a long time. And um, I got interested and uh, he gave me the login to one of his peptide certification courses. And uh, I logged in 
to just understand one of the peptides a little bit better. And it just, you know, completely changed my life once I got there. You know, I started, I realized there's this other side of medicine where there's these, you know, very intelligent physicians and researchers talking about the biochemistry of, mm-hmm. of, uh, of, of medicine. But not only that, but they were incorporating nutrition and exercise and they were describing uh, medicine in a completely different way. One, one that I can really get behind because at this point I'd already had some success, um, but it was mostly due to improving my lifestyle and a couple of supplements here and there. Um, and that's when I was introduced to, to peptide therapy. It was completely different from anything that I had learned as a pharmacist. As a pharmacist, you're usually, you know, learning about medications where they bind to a specific receptor and um, you're kind of just, you know, you're dealing with a lot of side effects. You're, you're just managing the disease state. You're not really reversing anything. You're not really preventing any, um, you know, further complications. I mean, maybe you're preventing a, some further complications, but um, it was like kind of a lifelong long thing. And uh, like a Band-Aid, like I mentioned. And I love the aspect of utilizing these peptides, even short term or cycling them to get people um, back to an efficient state, back to where they were when they were when they were younger. And um, it's been four years since then. I, I, I basically been every second of my life has been dedicated to this because it's just been it's just been so much fun. And at some point I had to start a business around it because you know my wife's asking me why I'm going from conference to conference to conference. Um, and and the thing that I realized, the biggest gap in, in this was that there's a big gap between the clinical research and the studies and medical practice and how these things can be used clinically. And that's where we, when we created New BioAge to kind of fill that gap and help practitioners understand what compounds are available, the molecular biology and the biochemistry behind how they work and, and how you can develop specific protocols for your, your, your patients and, and how to improve outcomes. And then that's, that's gone into a, a bunch of different projects from case studies to formulating specific supplements that go well with peptides to um, just evaluating the, the the research a little bit more and so it's it's been a rabbit hole but it's been it's been so much fun and um, and really rewarding awesome man I, I think you landed in in the perfect spot that kind of pulls together all of your your your, your formal training and your your personal passions and 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 where you want to see healthcare going and and that's a lot of the same reasons why heads up exists it's because we need ways to measure that this stuff is working the way it's supposed yeah. to work. And and I, I saw an opportunity out there. I, I stepped back from my corporate career in um, in IT, similar to you, looking to find something that was more rewarding. And I had been doing a lot of the health optimization and the biohacking stuff. And then I said, well, for me, I, I don't have the medical training. I'm a technologist. So for me, it was yeah. how can I provide something that the average person who's not necessarily super tech savvy can use to effectively manage their health. And if they're going to try different interventions that are a little bit outside of the mainstream, then how do you know that you're moving the needle in the right direction? So similar to you got into building heads up. I know you've been um, following our system now for a while. You kind of jumped in when we were first building it a few years ago and you've been following yeah. along. So it's good to be collaborating with you both at the level of uh, helping you with the outcomes research that you do. And then also now being able to collaborate with you on platforms like this. Uh, Lynn, it was the um, educational series that you did with SSRP, which was um, for me as a technology person, not a medical person, medically speaking, I'm a, I'm a lay person, but the way you uh, broke down the, um, biochemical pathways involved with weight loss was Mm -hmm. the first time I'd seen it laid out so uh, accessible to me as just, you know, a a normal person trying to figure out the weight loss algorithm. I like to call it an (laughs) algorithm because the the algorithm is different for everybody. So like (laughs) I'm trying to figure out the algorithm, right? For me, for Dave, just like you did when you were trying to lose it all. And so the way you broke it down, you, you broke down the pathways and then you broke down, okay, here's all the different ways we can hit these pathways using peptides, using supplements, using very specific kinds of exercise, and here's why it all works. So it was just awesome. And I, I thought we could spend the, the rest of the show just educating other people out there who are working on body recomposition, getting bits and pieces of it from here and there, but but hoping maybe to fill in some of the blanks for those listening who want to really maximize their results with um keeping the fat off and, uh, 
and staying lean and strong and fit and healthy as they get older and into uh, all, all phases of life. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I really like to, to hear that because it's something that, you know, I sit around thinking a lot about as to, you know, there's all this great information, but how do we relay, relay this information to patients? How do we relay this information to physicians? Because it, it can sound complicated. And, um, you know, one of the things I like to do is bring it back to the basics of things that everybody, everybody's already felt or ex experienced, right? So, you know, and, and it's this concept behind cellular intelligence and, and leveraging the intelligence uh, of, your, of your cells. And everybody's kind of already felt the way that this feels. So, so if you've ever done exercise for a consistent amount of time, you've probably felt a you know, clarity of mind, you've felt um, some improvements in body composition, you know, you, you, you just feel better. Even if you caloric restrict or you've done any fasting for any period of time, you, you probably felt this, um, you know, cl the clarity of mind, changes in body composition. And that's, that's cellular intelligence. That's, that's your body or your cell's ability to recognize a deficit of energy. Right. And it's and it's, you know, the sensor for this is something called AMPK and it's your cells recognizing this deficit in energy. And then it, there's just all these downstream effects that happen um, because of that. And, the, you know, NAD is involved. A lot of the buzzwords that you hear like NAD, CERT1. Um, but really, it's it's leveraging that same those same pathways, because when you look a lot of peptides, you look at a lot of supplements, what they're trying to do, even some pharmaceuticals, what they're trying to do is mimic what happens. Um, in our bodies when we when we caloric restrict or when we when we exercise nice. we're hitting the same yep. pathways and so that's a really um, helpful way to think about it Len. yeah and, and that's that's really what it boils you know what it really boils down to and um you know even, even something like, like nad right nad is this 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 big you know um topic it's a longevity molecule it's it's x y it's x and z it's it it, it um it, it increases energy well um do you take nad precursors do you take IV NAD? You know, it's not going to be a fad. Maybe what you take or how you consume NAD is going to be a fad, but NAD is never going to leave because NAD is a, a, a core a, a core process of all these cellular mechanisms um, that have to do with uh, a number of things, Any, anywhere from immune function to DNA repair to, to weight loss to cellular efficiency. So we're never going to stop talking about, you know, NAD, but I think the conversation kind of gets, you know, in, in the wrong direction when we start talking about, well, you know, what's the, the right precursor to use or what's the right, um, you know, do should we use IV NAD, subcutaneous NAD? Um, really what we should be doing is leveraging the, the body, the cell's own intelligence on how it wants to, it's supposed to use NAD. And, um, and, and what makes NAD so important is that it's, um, it's you know, sirtuins, right? So sirtuins are NAD dependent deacetylases, right? And so sirtuins known as longevity genes, um, you know, are they technically longevity genes? Not really, but if you look, it's, it's really all the downstream effects of what happens when you activate things like CERT1. But the core principle here is that you can't activate CERT1 without NAD. It's NAD dependent. This is one of the yeah. many things that makes NAD so important. But what happens when we activate CERT1? Well, this is where we have all those same pathways that we see in exercise. We have the activation of stuff called things like PGC1 alpha that's in charge of fat oxidation. You have, um, you know, PGC1 alpha is also in charge of our body's ability to upregulate its own antioxidant enzymes. Um, it has a lot to do with mitochondrial biogenesis, not just how your mitochondria is functioning, but the density of, of your mitochondria. Um, and it has a multiple downstream effects when it comes to inflammation and a number of other gene transcription factors. And that's when you can go down the rabbit hole of really understanding the biochemistry behind it. Um, but really, that system is a system that everybody, pharmaceutical companies, supplement makers, peptides are all leveraging, you know, that system. And if you can start there and understanding it, you can really start looking at these in, each in individual peptides and seeing, well, well, how is this peptide converging on, on these pathways? And um, for us, we started with, with weight loss, of course, because so many practitioners were trying to help uh, their patients, you know, lose weight. And so um, it started with weight loss, but what we realized it's, it's more about metabolism and it's not really about weight loss. It's about body composition. Right. Um, looking at somebody's BMI or looking at somebody, how many pounds somebody wants to lose doesn't do anything for us. And especially the conversations that we have, you know, with physicians. Right. So we're, we're, we're having more clinical conversations, not person needs to lose 10 pounds or 20 pounds. That's, you know, that's not the way that we're looking at things. We're looking we're analyzing people, patients risk for certain disease states. We're analyzing their body composition as to their muscle mass 
versus their fat tissue versus their their visceral fat. These are all the things that we're we're we're, we're contemplating when we're, when we're making decisions on how we want to uh, uh, attack this. And we're not really attacking weight loss. What we're attacking attacking is improved metabolism. All right, because metabolism has everything to do with insulin resistance. It has everything to do, to do with uh, the prevention of, of diabetes and obesity, because those are the like the prerequisites for everything that's taking us out, like you know cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disease, cancers. Right, so we're not really necessarily talking about weight loss. We're talking about longevity. If, you, if you're if you're just thinking about weight loss, um, you're 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 kind of missing the boat. You know, anybody can get their calories. And, 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 and lose a bunch of weight really quick. But what are you doing for, you know, your, your long-term health? Have you improved your exercise capacity? Have you improved, um, have you delayed the onset of, of, of chronic diseases? There's, there's so much. You can start off with weight loss, but you can, you can really, you know, develop protocols and programs for patients that are, that are lifelong that have to do more about health span and, and, and longevity. And it's not, they're, they're not two completely different subjects. They're, they're the same subject. Um, but yeah, I can get into a couple of these different concepts around body composition or, or peptides um, or supplements. Just uh, let me know which you know kind of which direction you you want to you want to start with. Well, you and I have been kind of like uh, jamming back and forth on like this super stack, and like yeah. the super stack for me, uh, the the foundation of the super stack would be understanding GLP one. So I'd like to talk about that, and then the um, GHRH, GHRP. So those are the the growth hormone. Uh, Lucinergy, I, I, I think it'd be important to understand how that works. Um, MOTC, BPC, and then uh, exercise and caloric restriction. So like when I watched your course, I started implementing each level of the stack. And uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I, I couldn't take MOTC. Uh, that one actually turns out to be one that I did not have a positive reaction to. But that stack to me... Oh, is the one I'm still using today and uh, getting incredible results. So let's, first of all, maybe just uh, talk about um, GLP-1. And uh, I'm going to try to remember some of the lingo from the course you did, Len. Now, I may butcher this as, as the tech nerd here, but but the, the GLP-1 is, is, is both insulin dependent. So it's kicking in after you eat. And it's also insulin independent, which means it, it's working on pathways, energy pathways, uh, not necessarily related to um, food consumption. So like, how, do, how the heck do these things work? And, and I'll frame it up by saying, you, you, you said it beautifully, we're trying to uh, emulate the cell's own intelligence in, in, for example, an energy deficit scenario, which which kicks in mm -hmm. these different reactions. So I know that we could probably spend the whole show just talking about yeah. GLP-1, but but at a high level, what are these what are these doing? How do they work? And, and how do those serve as like the foundation of the stack? And then we'll we'll, we'll layer on from there. Sure. Yeah, and uh, I'm glad that that was your your take home message there because it's absolutely I think one of the most important parts when people talk about GLP-1s. They, you know, they obviously know that you know the one of the main functions is that it. It secretes insulin in response to high glucose levels. And this is so important, um, especially when people are eating. It's like uh, postprandial insulin secretion. So when your glucose is going up after you've eaten, um, that's when it modulates that, that release of, of insulin that brings glucose into the cell um, you know, properly. And that's one of its, its main benefits. That's why it was studied. It was initially studied in neurodegenerative diseases because they were looking, looking at that specifically in neurodegenerative diseases. But they, 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 they saw how much uh, it was reducing glucose levels and hemoglobin A1C, and then it became something for diabetes. Um, but then with its, its appetite suppression and things like that, it became more of a, a weight loss drug. So that, that was kind of the cycle of, of, of how it happened. But what most people don't talk about is that it's insulin independent effect of glucose disposal. So one of the other things that GLP-1s can do is they can activate AMPK. And there comes that word again, AMPK is that nutrient sensor. Um, and, and it's an insulin independent way of bringing glucose into the cell. Because when you activate AMPK, just like you do with exercise, you can you, you translocate something called GLUT4, and that's what transports glucose you know, into the muscle cell. And so you can do that through exercise. And that's another function of GLP-1s, um, that they translocate GLUT4 and bring glucose into the cell independent of insulin, which is amazing. And you know, just so you can get a, a, a frame with this, if you think about even patients that are type 1 diabetics, 
they have to change the way that they, they, they do their insulin around exercise. Because even in insulin resistance patients, when you exercise, you in, improve that GLUT4 transport and you can improve your glucose disposal, right? So, so extra, that's why exercise is so important for so many different reasons, but it's almost like a natural way of, of disposing of glucose. So GLP-1 is insulin dependent, insulin independent. They also work on improving fat oxidation through a number of different mechanisms. Um, but they, I think this is a good, um, a good uh, part to start bringing in something like Lucinergy or the or the um, the supplement Lucinergy or the the research behind low dose leucine. And so leucine is usually something that you think of as you know anabolic or something that improves protein synthesis. Um, you know, usually like bodybuilders and stuff will take that post workout to improve their their um, their muscle gains or their improvement in, in protein synthesis. But there's some really interesting research about what leucine does at low levels. So at low doses of leucine, you can active actually activate cert one without activating mTOR, the anabolic side of things. And they found that a dose between one and 1.5 grams of leucine decreases the KM of NAD. Now, if you remember, I said recently that, you know, cert one is dependent, it's NAD dependent deacetylase. So it's dependent on the amount of NAD for it to be activated. So if you can reduce the amount of NAD needed to activate cert one, you're really improving your endogenous NAD utilization just by using this, uh, this, this amino acid in a, in a low dose. And so this same platform, these same researchers looked at combining this low dose of leucine with a number of different things. They were combining it with metformin and sildenafil for like triglycerides and weight loss. Um, they were combining it with nicotinic acid for cardio protection. Um, but some of the more interesting for what we're talking about here is that they, they had some studies uh, com uh, combining it with resveratrol, very small doses of resveratrol and um, as showing that they can improve insulin and glucose dynamics and insulin resistance. They also combined it with things like pyridoxine and they had studies in obese, obese patients where they can show an increase in fat tissue loss, which is expect exactly what we're looking for. And so that's why you know, there, we, we, we put together these, these compounds of leucine, resveratrol, B6 to improve um, that CERT1 activation. Why? Because we wanna enhance all those gene transcription factors that have to do with fat oxidation have to do with the, um, the, the upregulation of antioxidant enzymes and the ability to, to, to decrease inflammation. We also wanted to have that insulin independent way of, of glucose disposal, really converging on all the same pathways that GLP-1s um, converge on. And that's why most of the practitioners we work with, they'll use you know, something like Lucinergy with, with any GLP-1 that they're using. It's almost like the, the standard for them. Um, that's like a, a really good place to start when it comes to just uh, glucose control and, and, and weight loss. And that's, that's where we start. And now, yeah. Um, go ahead. I, I remember when we uh, met in Las Vegas, Lynn, we, we ran into each other at, at the conference there, you had the synergy available and that's before I had really educated myself at all on any of this stuff. But, but now I understand how it works biologically. So what we're doing here is we're just helping people understand what, how they can stack to, to continue to get, better results. So, so you layer in that GLP-1, you, you layer in the synergy, which is going to continue to amplify the benefits of uh, lipolysis, of uh, the way we, we manage glucose, the way we manage energy. So that was the second one I wanted to talk about was um, the Lucinergy product. I'm going to take a selfish moment here, Len, because I take the Lucinergy every day and I keep meaning to ask you, do you take it empty stomach or with food? So the first dose we take in the morning is on an empty stomach, you know, where you're in that okay. fasted, fasted lower yeah. state, and you're, you're already yeah. doubling down, you know, on a lot of those pathways. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. the second dose, you decide to take it is usually 90 minutes after um, lunch or 90 minutes after the first meal of the day if, if you know, you're intermittent fasting. And so right. good to know. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. All right. So we got we've got GLP-1. We've talked about um, Lucinergy, low dose leucine. Mm -hmm. Uh, w one other thing that we should mention is, um, especially for people who are looking to either preserve lean mass or build lean mass while they're also trying to um, work on fat loss, uh, energy reduction, metabolic health. You know, inevitably when, when fat comes off, there's a little bit of muscle that's going to come along for the ride. But mm -hmm. can we either e minimize that or maybe can... And this is the needle I'm trying to thread. I'm trying to thread the needle to say, can I actually increase the lean mass while the, mm -hmm. while the fat is coming off? So how would you uh, 
described leveraging the um, growth hormone peptides in the stack at this point? Sure. And so you bring up a, a great point and, and also a really big misconception, and um, especially with GLP-1s. Now, in anything that we've ever done for weight loss, if someone's losing weight um, rapidly, um, muscle comes off usually if certain things aren't happening, right? So if they're not doing resistance training, if they're not taking the right amount of protein, if they're not staying hydrated, yes, of course, muscle, um, muscle loss can happen. But the problem and the big misconception is that people are relaying that to the GLP-1s or like the mechanism of GLP-1s. Um, there's no mechanism in a GLP-1 that's actually um, causing muscle loss. We actually have studies Just showing technique. that. Um, yeah, well, we actually have studies saying the opposite as well. There's, there's studies showing that GLP-1s can be anabolic to skeletal muscle. So they're improving blood flow to muscle. So that makes there's, sense. they're actually beneficial to muscle. So if you can utilize GLP-1s while making sure someone stays hydrated, while they have sufficient protein intake and they are doing resistance training, you can put muscle on. And this is one of the great things that we're utilizing your platform right now because we know this is a big issue. And these are some case presentations and outcomes that we want to measure. And this is what we're doing right now. And we're already having tremendous results um, in showing that we can use uh, GLP-1s and either maintain muscle mass or even put muscle mass on um, in conjunction with other peptides. But you know, even just lifestyle modifications, specifically um, the ones that I mentioned, like hydration and, and resistance training. But um, that, that to, matches my experience, Len. Sorry to cut you off there. I just want to yeah. share my experience because I tried the GLP ones you know, for uh, whatever, six or eight weeks, something like that. I did DEXA before and I did DEXA after. And during that period, I significantly ramped up my hydration. And I was even measuring it on uh, the, the, the simple little app I use on my phone. I have this water bottle here. So every time I crush the bottle, I'd, I'd log 32 ounces. I was going for like 100 or more ounces a day. I was lifting every single day. I was, I was uh, taking protein. And I went back to get my DEXA scan after eight weeks. And I had put on um, eight pounds of lean mass. And this was during, wow. you know, the quote unquote uh, GLP-1 protocol. So you're, you're helping me understand the why. It's like, hey, if you're actually lifting, and you're hydrating, and you're getting adequate protein, you actually have a very good chance of increasing lean mass while you're you're also doing all these other amazing benefits for um, cellular energy and metabolism. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think we just need to do a better job of, of showing that. And that's why, you know, your platform is so important, because it's what I'm going to be utilizing when I'm going to my presentations and when I'm reviewing case studies. Um, I mean, in just this, just in a couple of weeks, we'll be at the uh, Peptide World Congress um, talking about just this, you know, th this topic, um, awesome. spending a lot of time on cellular hydration. But to, to, your, to your point, um, utilizing um, other peptides that improve um, your own endogenous uh, physiological secretion of, of growth hormone, like CJC and epimoralin is, is a, a yeah. tremendous tool. And if you look That's at the one peptides, I use. Yeah. And if you look at peptides or any GHRH or GHRP, you know, it's a combination of a, a growth hormone releasing hormone or a growth hormone releasing peptide. Um, any combination of these, if you look at if you if you look at the cell signaling capabilities, or if you look at some of the biochemistry of what's happening with a lot of these peptides, well, it's going to sound very familiar. They're increasing AMPK, they're uh, increasing CERT one, they're improving that NAD plus to NADH ratio. Um, so they're working on a lot of these same pathways that we're always uh, that we're also mimicking. The difference here is that. Um, when you can improve growth hormone secretion, uh, growth hormone is catabolic to fat tissue and anabolic to muscle tissue, which is, you know, so important, right? So we're doing both things that we're looking to accomplish. We're hitting the AMPK side of things, um, specifically to fat tissue. And it also has this other um, enhanced side of, of, of what it has effect on, on muscle, right? And so improvement in the, in your body's ability to um, secrete your own growth hormone and pulse it out naturally. Exactly. The way that um, the way that it's meant to be can have a pronounced effect. Now, not just necessarily muscle building; it's going to have a great effect on muscle, but it's really improving somebody's exercise capacity. Because we already talked about how important exercise is. Like that was that's not new news to anybody. Um, but what we can do that's tremendous is help people exercise, help their exercise capacity, help them exercise better. Utilize some of these tools like GHRHs and GHRPs. 
Um, because it's not just the exercise that they're doing, but it's how fast can they recover? You know, as we age, you, you know, that you just don't recover yeah. as fast as you as you wanted to. And um, that, that's where these peptides really come into play is, is improving the way people exercise and improving um, how fast they, re they can recover. Because you can get people to lose re weight really fast on GLP ones, right? Everybody's has figured that out so far, but it's really about it's really about what can you do to their exercise capacity? Because once they lose all that weight, now if they want to have all those health benefits um, of improving markers like VO2 max, that is such a, an important marker for longevity. Well, the the gains from that point are going to be really reliant on how well they can exercise, and so uh, providing these uh, different compounds and peptides to improve their exercise capacity is um, is really key. And so, and then that, that's that's really the the strategy that we take with CJC at Memorial. It's improving a ton of things. It works on stage four deep sleep. It it um it, it's got a lot of, of benefits for the brain and all and a, and a number of different things. But um, when you're talking, if you're talking about just specifically muscle, it's it's amazing in that it's catabolic to fat tissue and anabolic to muscle tissue, which is the opposite of something like cortisol, right? And this is why sleep and stress management is so important. Because what does cortisol do? Cortisol is anabolic to fat tissue and catabolic to muscle tissue, it's doing the opposite, you know? And so, um, yeah. and so that's why it's, it's, it's such an amazing, an amazing peptide. Well, it helps, it helps you understand why stress actually, if, if you're in a high stress situation, stressor could be emotional, it could be a physical, it could be environmental, but if your body's under stress and you're trying to make gains in, in terms of your um, physical health or body composition, you can see that stress actually does the opposite. It, 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 it's making it easier to, to put on fat and it's, it's, it's having a, a detrimental effect on muscle. And then I remember from your presentation, that was one of the things I took away the, the, the growth hormone, uh, GHRH, GRHRP, that's the opposite. It's making it easier for you to put on muscle. And now correct me if I'm wrong. The only other, um, uh, hormone, I believe that you said that can do that is testosterone. Right. If my memory serves me correctly, yes. is that right? Yeah. We're not talking about taking that here, yeah. but 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 for people to understand that that's also one of the things that yeah. has that dual action: pack on muscle, kill fat. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And and you bring up a good point. What's what's another way that we can improve t testosterone outside of using exogenous testosterone? And it's lifting, you know, lifting heavy things that has a pronounced effect on it. So it's um, I love yeah, it's, it. It's all it all comes to together. Yeah, you got to go do the squats. You got to go do the bench press. You got you got to put things in your hands that are heavy. Like like let's define um, resistance training. Uh, and 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 depending on where you're at physically, a lot of people who uh, haven't lifted before, or they may be at a stage of life where um, they're either um, frail. So you, you have to be careful in some cases with strength training. But but to really goose the testosterone when you go in the gym. You, for me, I'm looking at putting some heavy weight on the squat rack mm -hmm. and I want to be struggling to get that fifth rep up. So I'm going to do five sets of five reps and it's going to be heavy enough that like it is seriously hard when I'm getting into those last couple sets and those last couple reps. Or I'll do pull ups that activate all the muscles in like the back, biceps, shoulders, or I'll do a barbell bench press, for example. Again, putting enough weight on there that I'm really struggling. And that when I come back a few days later recovered, I'm able to put on another five or 10 pounds. Mm -hmm. So um, that type of training for me is is what I consider the best ways to increase testosterone. Would you uh, want to add anything to that or change anything with like the best type of training for testosterone increase? No, yeah, you you, you nailed it. And 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 you're you know very fortunate and lucky to be able to to exercise like that. And that's because of what you know the work that you've done to get there and and that's a that's a great point because you know a lot of people are completely sedentary when we talk to them or when our physicians talk to them and um and they're starting from from uh, from a different point and that's why utilizing some of these peptides are so important because you can take someone that's sedentary and just getting getting them to move around is going to make a big difference um there's a study showing that if you can get someone that's completely sedentary to working out 90 minutes per week which is 13 minutes per day you've um, decrease their mortality rate by 14%. So even in, in, in getting someone to just start moving, you're making a significant yeah. impact. And this is what we, we're, we're, we're talking to our physicians about as to everybody's going to be on a different spectrum. You know, you're on, you're on this side of the spectrum and it's amazing that you can, you can do those things. 
but we're going to have patients coming in on the other side of the spectrum. And we have to build this base to hopefully get them to one point where they are doing maybe using some bands and getting some more um, resistance training. Because something that's really important is that, you know, you don't want to get hurt, right? And, and that brings us to, you know, like the next pepper exactly. that's so important, which is a BPC-157, right? And there's many reasons why we utilize this in, you know, it's more known for gut health and it's known for injuries and things like that. But another thing that's not um, talked about enough is that BPC actually upregulates growth hormone receptors and works on growth hormone uh, receptor density, especially in tendon fibroblasts. You mentioned so that this, on your training, and it's the first time I'd heard it before. Yeah, and 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 that's 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 why it goes so well with the GHRH and GHRPs. Not only are you improving your own endogenous secretion of growth hormone, but you're actually upregulating these receptors, right? So making it much more efficient. But what I love about it is that it's it's almost like it works as an injury prevention, or you know, of course they use it in injury recovery. But if you can improve, um, you know, if you can improve or, or make it safer for people to exercise or make it safer or better for them to recover because what when do a lot of um injuries happen when people aren't fully recovered right when they're not 100 percent and they come in the next day and their technique is not as good and so that's why something like bpc can be um tremendous for recovery improving um see you know improving the, the growth hormone secretagogues as well and so that's another really important one that we love to to add to a lot of uh physicians and then their, and their protocols yeah, so we've hit uh, the GLP ones. We've hit uh, Lucinergy, low dose leucine. We've hit the growth hormone peptides. We uh, we've talked about BPC. We've talked about um, the importance of strength training, and yeah. also just the importance of movements. Wherever you're at today, any movement is better than no movement, and and it, it works. There are lots of different reasons that helps. There's also um, two other things I wanted to ask you about as part of the stack, Len, depending on time here. Uh, caloric restriction, you know, that's kind of the mother of all, right? That's where at the beginning of the show you said, wow, when you're fasting, and I love doing 72-hour fasts. I do them once a quarter. Mm -hmm. And when I get like 48 hours in, my brain is just like on another level of supercharge. So uh, I don't do it all the time, but when I do, it's it's really quite a wild. It's actually a pretty wild experience because <laughs> your body's kind of in this fight or flight mode, but it's also in like this supercharge mode where all kinds of different like catecholamine brain stuff is going on. So um, maybe you could come. And again, the whole thing is like, hey, I want to approach a protocol for weight loss and lean mass growth. And I know I can do one thing. I can do fasting or I can do exercise or I can do GLP-1. But what we're laying out here is like you can exponentially increase the results, you know, when you start building these stacks. And so the other one in the stack was caloric restriction. Mm -hmm. uh, anecdotally, Len, I know that from uh, some of the research I've read where, where they found what's the number one thing we, we could do to increase uh, longevity. I believe this was done in like mice or rats or something like that. And of all the stuff we had a name for out there, the one thing that worked the best was not eating. So um, maybe you can just like throw a couple words in on like, how does caloric restriction work so good for, for, uh, for body recomposition and for energy yeah. levels and just in general? And, and how do you throw that in the stack safely? You know, cause one of the things with GLP is you're not hungry. And you got to mm -hmm. be careful that you're maintaining nutrient density and protein. And so then you throw fasting in and it's like, well, I want to make sure that I'm still uh, getting enough um, nutrients in my body. So how do you how do you slot that one in? Yeah. And, and, it, and it boils down to what we talked about at the beginning is if you if you create this deficit of an energy and your, your, your cells sense that and activate AMPK, you have all those downstream effects that are almost identical to um to exercise with with autophagy thinning cells out um upregulating a, a number of, of different beneficial catabolic things um that that is so beneficial in, in weight loss and, and the way that we approach this actually when we first started doing this uh one of our first protocols that, like our initial protocol program that we put together was we would have people do like a, a five-day um fasting mimicking diet or a three-day water fast to, to start. And I mean, the results were amazing because they would just clean out their cells. Um, they would, they would, you know, we'd have all these positive benefits and then we utilize peptides and then just their cells were firing way better than if they didn't do that. We stopped doing that because, you know, it was just too tough for people to start there, especially if you're getting someone into 
start a new lifestyle and you're asking them to go on this intense, you know, fast at the beginning. Um, we just didn't have the, the success rate. The, the outcomes were amazing, but people just couldn't stick to it. Now, where we use this is, is you know, clinically, it's very dependent on, on where that patient is at, um, especially with their, um, with their insulin resistance, if they're diabetic, if they're pre-diabetic. Um, and we'll, we'll try to utilize something like intermittent fasting or, or caloric restriction. Mean, caloric restriction can be a number of different things, just you know, minimizing the amount of calories. It can be minimizing the amount of hours that you eat in a day. Um, but we'll, we, we really leave that up clinically to where they're at, right? So in, in patients Understood. like uh, diabetic or pre-diabetes, um, they seem to have a, you know, a great, you know, a much better effect with, with, with carbohydrate restriction, specific carbohydrates or with caloric restriction. Um, if we see in their lab work that they're having, you know, that really high hyperinsulinemia, things like that, where we're really trying to change things and change things quickly for them, we'll, we'll incorporate something like that. It also depends a lot on when we get back their body composition metrics, right? Well, yep. where are they at with, with muscle mass? You know, sometimes you have yep. patients that are metabolically unstable. They have plenty of muscle. So am I, am I too concerned with, with losing a little bit of muscle while getting them metabolically stable? No, I'm not. I, I'm, I'm fully aware of how important muscle mass is to longevity, but it really depends on where they're at in that spectrum. Um, and, and another key point there is, um, you know, there's plenty of studies showing that muscle strength is more important than muscle mass. So they're, both, they're both important, but um, a perfect sense. example. Yeah, perfect example. I just had someone come in that was, um, you know, uh, morbidly obese, uh, wanted to lose some weight, um, utilizing GLP ones and some of the other things that we're talking about. And they lost in the first month. It was, um, actually have it up on my board here, uh, put it over his results. It was, they lost 11 pounds of fat tissue and three pounds of, of muscle mass. Right. So was I concerned with that th three pounds of muscle mass they lost at the same time while losing 11 pounds of fat tissue? No, because they were, they were adequately muscled. Right. And in the same time period, they had gotten stronger because we got them doing resistance training. So was there any negative effects there? No, because the studies are very clear that muscle strength is, is even more important than muscle mass. Um, and, and so those are some of the things that we're looking at clinically to assess um, how we're going to go about using some th things like caloric restriction. Um, and it also works a little bit differently for everybody. You know, like I do really well with caloric restriction. Um, it's yeah. just a matter of, you know, there's some key things that you just we're 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 not going to we're not going to sacrifice for it. Um, is it causing us to not get enough protein in? Is it causing us not, the ability to not exercise or use resistance training? Is it um, is it affecting our hydration status? Right. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of water in food. And when you caloric restrict you, um, you also your water intake is less. And something that people don't know about GLP ones is that it reduces thirst intake. Right. Um, yes. or, or, or I've water that as well. I've got to be really mindful of making sure that like yeah. I'm, I'm uh, hydrating it's properly. Really key components that we do, and then and and, and the hydration is is so important um, with cell signaling. If you're utilizing peptides, if you if you want to protect muscle, if you want to improve, um, you know, protein synthesis, you know, and, and increasing the volume of the cell is is really putting it in the state of um, it's a it's 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 most efficient way of signaling. It's, it's, it improves protein synthesis. Um, it improves um, anabolic uh, signaling compared to if someone is dehydrated or has low intracellular water and they have you know cell shrinkage and then you have a catabolic effect and now it could now it could be um, degrading muscle. So hydration is so important when it comes to muscle strength um, and muscle mass. So as long as all those pieces are in place, I mean I think caloric restriction is great, uh, especially intermittent fasting. It just really depends on where you're at, and so. One quick point on this is we don't stick to a specific protocol, right? So when people come in and they're maybe metabolically unstable or we need to lose some weight rapidly, we might use caloric restriction. We might use intermittent fasting, but we'll get that weight off and we'll get them to a more metabolically stable position. And now we'll pivot over to having more meals per day, maybe not caloric restricting. Because why? Because yeah. their exercise capacity has gone up. Their metabolic rate has gone up. Now we have lost the fat tissue that we want to lose. Now we want to fo focus on muscle mass. So we're not doing as much caloric restriction. Absolutely. So it really depends, you know, where they're at in, in that spectrum. Um, but it's just such an effective tool, such an effective tool. Yeah, it's all part of personalizing it. You know, I have a family member I'm working with right now that we're at the opposite end of the spectrum. Like the most important thing is, is to be putting on lean mass. And so I guess that's just where each individual is a little different. But just in the context of like all the things that really, really 
hit the pathways. We've we've covered a lot of them. Caloric restriction was the last one. There's there's one more I want to ask you about, Lynn, and then maybe we could just spend a few minutes educating people on how to actually make sure that they're um, measuring the right things when they do this. So the last one was uh, sadly the one that I do not tolerate very well. But you had also yeah. mentioned the ability to layer in uh, MOTS C. And that, that would be done to increase, again, uh, the capacity for exercise and uh, exercise performance. So um, that was the last one I wanted to throw in to the whole blender here on different ways we can um, maximize our results. Uh, comments on just how MOTC fits into the equation? Yeah, so it's too bad that you can't take that one. It's my, my personal I tried favorite. twice. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I had a horrible experience twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so MOTC is a mitochondrial peptide. And um, I would say it's probably the closest one to an exercise mimetic because if you look at what yeah. it's doing, it's working, it's doing a number of different things. Um, they were studying it in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. They were studying it in cancer. But if you look at what it's doing, it's, at, it's, it's, it's working directly on AMPK, right? So same system. Um, but MOTC has been shown to improve uh, glucose uptake um, it's insulin sensitizing. It inhibits something called myostatin, which has everything to do with muscle. So not only is it working on metabolism and glucose and insulin dynamics, it's improving fat loss. It's improving, um, has positive effects on muscle. And really the reason that I take it, our reason, the reason that we utilize it, or a lot of practitioners are utilizing it is in this concept of exercise capacity, um, taking it two to three times a week, 30 minutes before exercise, people really, um, you know, really feel that Im improvement in the way that they exercise and in their endurance. And there's some, you know, preclinical models uh, showing showing that as to it improving endurance, improving uh, uh, the ability to, to, to exercise better. And so really that's when we, we, we utilize it and a lot of the physicians utilize it is to really um, increase exercise capacity. And um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing peptide. All right. Well, that's the one that I sadly won't be able to dabble with, but I've got enough going on with all the other uh, improvements I've made. And, and I don't come from a family with genetics that are naturally tending to be um, lean, quite the opposite. So it, it's taken me a long time to figure out the right algorithm. But what I've come to the conclusion is that when you start to understand the tools that we've talked about here today, and you start to know how to properly implement those and work with a practitioner who can help you do it safely and effectively, it becomes clear that there's absolutely no reason why your body composition, your health status should not continue to get uh, significantly better as you uh, age. You know, even as the body's aging, what these cellular compounds do is help us to continue to get to that next peak of optimal. And at 47 years old, I, I, I can say that I have the best body composition I've ever had. But more importantly, when I get all my blood work run and I look at my lipid panels and I look at my insulin markers and I look at my hemoglobin A1C, um, those are also the numbers that say, OK, there's there's the part of it that's like just looking good and feeling good. Right. That's just yeah. awesome out there in life, just being at your best physically. But then when you get when you get the blood work run. So when I, when I did my first protocol, I, I went and got my labs done afterwards. The cholesterol, and, and I'm in heads up, I have my data going back 20 years at this point. So like I could see that like my numbers were better at 47 than they've ever been in my entire life. And that's mm -hmm. when you start to really see that like, okay, this, this really is powerful. And when you start to get the metabolism dialed in and healthy, and you start to get body composition dialed in and healthy and, and you start to use all of these things, the whole system as a whole, the whole instrument, you know, is just tuned at a, at a higher frequency. And um, the results have been uh, amazing for me personally. So I guess maybe that's a segue, Lynn, to, um, to say, what are you really looking at for outcomes? You know, you can, it's, it's not just stepping on the scale. And honestly, if I used scale weight as my assessment of progress in my protocol, I think I've actually gone up. So like I'd say, hey, this GOP one shit doesn't work at all. But, but like <laughs> but then I see how my clothes are fitting and, and it's totally different. So help us understand how to properly measure it so that we don't misinterpret the data, because I would have totally misinterpreted scale weight in and of itself 
but there's so mm -hmm. much else going on that's getting better. So like, I know you're measuring these outcomes. What are you specifically looking at? So some of the, you know, a lot of attention to body composition metrics, you know, of course, mm -hmm. um, and, and we're now starting to look a lot at total body water, intracellular water in relationship to, um, because we're starting to see the research behind how important cellular hydration is to muscle performance, muscle strength, um, and a number of, of, of different things, especially with the use of, of GLP ones, but just in, in general and cardiometabolic, there's a there's a lot of things looking at, at there, and we get that good data from some, using something like an in body, but paying attention to uh, visceral fat scores, to the amount of lean mass they have, the the um, the amount of fat tissue they have, and making sure that everything's going um, in the right direction, and it's a lot of fun to look at that um, as well with some you know key um, uh, biomarkers with like hemoglobin A1C, fasting insulin levels. We can see the insulin and glucose dynamics um, changing for people. We can see that their efficiency is getting better. They're looking at other markers that uh, show us insulin resistance, you might not think about when it comes to lipid panels, when it comes to um, triglycerides and HDL ratios, um, because that's one thing that people don't realize is sometimes you don't see the insulin resistance and glucose and insulin levels, and it's because it's showing up in, in triglycerides. Because what happens when we, we can't get um, glucose into the cell or we get muscle insulin resistant? Well, we get fat accumulation in the liver, right? And so we're looking at LFTs, we're looking at triglycerides and HDLs and making sure that all that's moving in, in the right in the right direction. Those are probably the main ones. And, and the ApoB, um, just because you know, cardiovascular disease is, is the number one killer. And, 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 and assessing someone's risk and assessing someone's um, uh, tendency for atherosclerosis or risk for atherosclerosis. So those are some of the main ones that, we, that we're, we're taking a look at right now because it goes along. We haven't talked about the immune system. We haven't talked about gut health or autoimmunity, but um, there's this new um, kind of study of immunometabolism and, and how or like how getting metabolism optimized, what effect that ha has on autoimmune wow. disease or awesome. immune issues or gut health issues. And so right now we're, yeah. we're, we're focusing on metabolism, but we have some case studies where we're following patients with autoimmune disease, with gut health issues, and seeing if we can maximize and optimize their metabolism, what is that doing for some of their other things that they're dealing with, like their autoimmune disease or gut health issues. And so body composition just tells us so much as to, I mean, there's no pure way of knowing if you're biochemistry of what's going on, um, in somebody's body by their body composition actually changing for the better. And so it's something that we're focusing on right now, but there's so many things that you can measure on Heads Up. And um, thank you so much for providing something like that, because if it wasn't for something like that, I mean, for me, just a peace of mind when I go in there and I see a certain lab value and I wonder, hey, what was I like when I was in like my 20s? And it's pulling that data from you know, some of the other lab, lab companies, you know, when I was not even looking at my results um, and seeing how I've been trending. And I'm just like you, I'm in, I, have the, I have the best body composition that I've ever had at 42 years old. Um, and and it's, just, it's just getting better and better. And, um, and a big part of that is tracking those outcomes. Um, and it's, it's such, an, uh, such an efficient, such an amazing tool that you're providing. And it's, it's making a huge difference in, in how we educate practitioners because you know, there's not as much data as you would see in a typical pharmaceutical, you know, pharmaceutical company or a pharmaceutical drug. There's not as, you know, the, the money's not behind it. And so using your platform and, and following these outcomes makes a huge difference for when we're out there teaching or out there presenting to other physicians um, for them to get on board with this, you know, new form of cellular medicine that incorporates um, exercise and nutrition and a number of different things. And um, it's, it's, it's super valuable. So, so thank you so much for, for what you're providing out there. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, Len, for all the amazing education that you're putting out there. And, and part of the goal for Heads Up, you know, initially it was to help people uh, better self-manage their, their stats, especially when they were doing uh, non-standard interventions. So initially it was designed for people to use to make sure that they're, they're doing things properly. But another major goal for Heads Up was to have the data to show that these protocols work as good or better than what we have. And the only way that's going to happen is if guys like you get in there and start putting in the in-body scans and putting in all the blood work and putting in all the CGM data and, and finding, finding data 
outcomes we may not even have seen because in a lot of even with drug drug discovery and and clinical trials they might not be putting everybody on an in-body scanner every three months and, and they might not necessarily be running air, some of the more advanced labs or looking at the heart rate variability or anything like that so i actually think we're in a position where we're going to have better data and more comprehensive data and, and that's oh, where I think that is such a, that's just such a good point because even all the the, the the studies with GLP ones did they do any body composition data like there's like almost zero right and it's like what did that really tell us right and so yeah you're right you make a great point uh, um, some of our data and some of the presentations that we make are even more compelling than some of the research that's out there because of, of what we're tracking it's a great point well this is just like something that I'm on a massive nerd safari on with all of this cellular medicine peptide stuff it, you, once you go down the rabbit hole it's just crazy and awesome so i'm i'm yeah. i'm loving every second of it and uh i'll see you lynn in um a few weeks in uh, malibu for the conference i'm looking forward to your presentation there today and this was awesome we, we covered everything I, I was hoping we could cover your your the the talk i study was really educational and inspirational for me because it helped me fill in so many blanks about not just how can I get results, but it's how can I exponentially maximize my results by taking all of these things and, and putting them together and just kind of like supercharging the stack. So grateful for your time here today, Len. And then if there's any um, anything you want to leave with the audience, just in terms of either uh, how to find you or how to um, get access to some of the um, products and services and educational content you put out there, uh, anything you want to leave us with? Sure. So we, we work, you know, directly with medical practices and helping them, you know, put together their protocols and and, um, and helping them out there. So you can just go to newbioage.com to to register your practice. Um, we also provide a lot of the, the supplements that we uh, formulate to enhance peptide therapy. Um, and uh, we'll be working very soon on a you know direct to consumer uh, model as well. So. Um, and and it's we're all already, waiting for that, Len, because we all want yeah, it. We just <laughs> yeah. I know. I just I am. You know, I didn't set out to formulate supplements. It wasn't like part of our business plan or anything like that. It was just that, you know, we were looking at the data and it just wasn't available. And so we yeah. we wanted to test it out, and um, it's really taken off with a lot of practitioners. And um, and, and so yeah, we'll, we'll be we'll be doing that soon. Um, and you know some of the educational, some of the best education when it comes to cellular medicine on, is on seed scientific research and, and performance. Um, and you can find a lot yeah, of this we'll stuff to them. there. Yeah, and I'm a, I'm a faculty member there, and there's um, an endless amount of, of information there that you can really get just the, the highest level of education when it comes to cellular medicine and peptide therapy. Awesome. Yeah, we'll link to um, to their website. I've kind of stumbled into that conference last year just at the last minute and it was it was awesome and i imagine this year from what i'm hearing is going to be even bigger and better that that whole community is really starting to grow so um yeah. we'll, we'll link to their website uh this was awesome len thank you brother and i look forward to more uh, awesome collaboration with you awesome thank you so much thank you for listening to data driven health radio 